As Liberians look ahead to another election, the people are faced with many challenges, especially as it relates to Liberia's dual currency and the effects it is having on the economy. The rising foreign exchange rates, high tariffs at the Freeport of Monrovia, increased taxation, rising tuition costs, the lack of farm-to-market roads, high unemployment, and the unfair advantage many Liberians believe foreigners have over them in their own country are some of the pressing issues on the minds of average everyday people living and working in Liberia. One of the things I really gave me a problem is the weight and we have problem with the port. Because at the port, they have the pain to the port, they're very expensive. So that way, the people are picking the goods, so all the goods are expensive. And we that send a petty trader people, we get a problem with it because when we buy the goods expensive, we sell it expensive. And now we're not getting much profit to support our children. Now we say we are Liberians. Mm -hmm. We deal with liberty. We are not dealing with U.S. This country is not U.S. country. But now if you go in the store to buy any goods from the store, they say U.S. And they say not putting in liberty, they put the rate up. Instead of telling say 80 or so, they find the rate, they say 115, they rate 113, they rate in the store. So that means they're taking it to be a U.S. rate. But two children are going and they're not going to government school. They're going to private school. And I pay a lot of money. They all the small, the big one in the laundry. I pay thirty nine thousand for each person. The small one in the laundry. Just imagine I pay thirty thirty one. So just calculate. Then the small business will do it. Then the pep follow they not working. And all the business all of all we eating in we paying child a children tuition. What, what, what? My issue is about the fullness in the country. They take over our businesses, we are not profiting. We go to the store to buy goods from them. They sell the goods to all by dozen. They paint it, they sell it to all five dollars for dozen. And then when, they, when, when we buy it from them, bringing it out to sell retail, then they will turn around and give it to people in the store again for five dollars, one dozen. So for that reason, we are not getting customers. If a customer come out and go to them, they get a price in one dozen. So how will we say? So in other words, they're selling both wholesale, wholesale and retail. Wholesale, retail, dozen, simple, everything Bing. they're selling. So for that well, reason, we can't have them. time or sell. We don't even sell. Welcome to this special interview with Honorable Oscar Cooper at his residence in Santa. Good day, Honorable Cooper. Welcome, Anna from TLC. You're welcome. Thank you very much. We'll go straight over to asking you, Honorable, what is it, what do you see as a pressing issue that Liberians are faced with? Well, there are a lot of issues. There are not just one pressing issue. Uh, Post-war Liberia faced with a lot of pressing issues. One is the quality of our teachers, uh, delivering quality education to our young people. Another is delivering quality health care to our people. Another is the jobless rate. People without jobs are creating jobs for the people to work and take care of their family. Uh, one is developing the value system, the behavior system of uh, People. Another is the culture of corruption in the country it needs to uh, be dampened, uh, work hard on. Uh, another is the greed, the selfishness. And there's a lot of uh, pressing issues that um, a leader needs to address in this country. A lot of challenges. What is your attitude towards the private sector growth? Before I became senator, I was a businessman. I've been a businessman in this country since 1981. 
and I've only been in government since 2012. So I always work for people as general manager or I have my own company as an entrepreneur. We talk about Liberianization. We talk about letting Liberians take over their economy. But we don't implement policy and we don't give the Liberians a fighting chance to take their economy from the Lebanese, the Indians, the Fulanese. We are not saying we don't want the Lebanese, the Indian, the Fulanese, but we want our Liberians to have control of their destiny. And that's the economic destiny that Liberians must have an advantage because it's their country. And they need to have an advantage or be able to be promoted that they take over the economy. Okay, so we have uh, plans in the works on how we will do it. Like example, you go for a bid in a construction building. A Liberian, once they are qualified to bid, they must have plus 5 to 10 percent over the bid and they should be considered. Okay? You have to have affirmative action like you have in South Africa. Like how apartheid was over and the blacks to give the blacks chance to get into the economic side of the country, not just the political side. So in Liberia you have Liberians controlling the politics of what the Lebanese and the Indians and the Fulanese controlling the economy. So you have to have an affirmative action program to give Liberians a, a, a helping hand to enter that economy and take charge. Another thing is bringing in uh, pro, uh, provisions, sardines, uh, bringing in corned beef, bringing in beer, bringing in frozen fish, frozen chicken. Why Liberians can't do it? Why? Maybe because they don't have the working capital or the large sum of money to import these things. So we have to get serious Liberians and make it available through government loans, through the central bank, and give these Liberians training. But whether, you know, whether Liberians do it and they fail, all business people don't jump into business and succeed right away. They fail and learn from their experience. So we got to be studying behind our Liberians, propping them up, backing them to enter this importation business and making a piece of it, a good share of it, so Liberians can bring in Hennigan beer. Liberians can bring in these things, the IPD. We have to make policy and we got to enforce it and make sure the Minister of Commerce and make sure all these people are playing by the rule and not selling the country cheap or selling the people out. Now one thing you didn't ask me about uh, is, is, is the, 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 the high Liberian dollar exchange to the U.S. dollars. It's very high. And it costs them most of the market women and most of the farmers hard time. Because when they bring their potato green, when they bring their cassava, when they bring their pepper and their bitter ball, by the time they get it to the market, the rate is so high, they carry the price up to be able to buy something to carry by in the country. We need to look at that whole two money system. If it's not working, then we'll go to one Liberian dollar. Let everybody feel it. And now you can, Oscar Cooper, be making U.S. dollars. And my U.S. dollars does not devalue. But you, Anna, you're making 10,000 LD. At the time I give you 10,000 LD, the rate was 1 to 60 Liberian dollars. you still making that 10,000 LD, now the rate is 1 to 110. You have lost purchasing power. So I think it would just be good. The whole country just go to the Liberian dollar. So no picking and choosing them. Because when we, the leaders, are feeling the pinch of that Liberian dollar, we do the right thing. But most of the small people get paid in Liberian dollars. So their purchasing power, if I could buy rice for $15 a cup, now I buy rice for $30 a cup. My, my purchasing power now, I could buy two cups, now I can only buy one. Because I now 
15, 18. So we got to get serious. What good for Peter got to get good for Paul. Let's talk about youth development. The youth, most of them have been sat in classes before. And the unemployment rate is high. They don't have basic skills. What would be your strategy? This thing is basic. Start from the basic side. Education. Preparing that person from ABC to kindergarten to sixth grade. Giving them their foundation. Post-war Liberia, we have not given the youth or the young people the foundation for them to fight out there and maintain a job when they get the job. So we, the, 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 those that are governing, are responsible. So let's go to basic education first and start preparing the foundation so that when you go to junior high school, when you leave sixth grade, you go to junior high school, you are ready with the basic foundation of education to read and write and comprehend. Then we go to middle school or junior high school. And then we go to senior high school. You're coming into a system, our young people are not properly prepared. Not because of them, but because of their leaders. So now you come into power if you are given the opportunity to, 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 to govern this country. You have young people that you have to go and reskill. So we have ideas of building these boot camps around big cities in various counties to give our children skill training, those we can't send back to sixth grade or junior high, but to give them a trade, a craft, that they will be able to put to work. And even when we give them the craft, we'll find jobs before they leave that training vocational academy. So there's a lot to do with the youth. It's not going to be done in, in six years. It's not going to be done in 12 years. But we have to look at the, the education system and we have to evaluate it and we have to correct it. What would be your own personal commitment to well, education? You, on the farm you see here, my wife and I, Benu, since 2007, we have been educating all the village children from around here besides the people that work for the farm. And we are hands on. So I visit the classes. I monitor the teachers. My wife visits the classes. She monitors the teachers. And just today you saw us what they were doing the spelling bee and the little program. We were there, giving them the you know the background, the moral support, giving them that we are here for you. So we have to be hands on. The country is behind. You and I can sacrifice and say, okay, I will take one government school, I will go there twice or three times a month. You understand? And monitor the teachers to see if they are doing what they're supposed to do. It doesn't have to be a DEO or a CEO. But you can do that, you know? So we need to do this thing. During the Ebola crisis in Liberia, Senator Oscar Cooper did not run away from the country. He stayed right here and joined the fight against Ebola by developing a community-based approach to fighting the disease. Honorable Cooper, you are in the house. You know and I know that the cost of living is so high. Yes. How do you intend on reducing, helping to reduce Look, the cost of living? 